everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show, and welcome to Forensics Talks. This is episode 57, and today my guest is Brian Childs. Uh, don't forget, we are streaming to several platforms, so this is going to be going to YouTube, it's going to be going to Facebook and LinkedIn, and also podcasts. So after this is all said and done, in the future, I take many of these episodes, and I place them onto uh, some of your favorite platforms for podcasting, whether it's uh, Apple, Spotify, and all those other ones. So uh, if you miss this one uh, live, you can always check it out. Uh, while you're working in the background as a podcast in the future. Also, uh, let us know where you are from in the chat window. I always like to see where people are from and uh, where they are listening. So if you're overseas or anything, by all means, uh, please put it in there. And don't forget also during the interview here, always great when we get uh, you know questions from the audience, if there's any um, comments or questions you have for the speaker. I'm going to do my best to uh, pass those along here. Okay, let's get into it. And my guest today is Brian Childs, and he's a senior investigations engineer uh, in, responsible for managing and conducting investigations for Axon customers, attorneys, or even civilians. And over he has over 15 years of research and development, validation testing, forensic testing, and analysis for Axon. He has over 25 years in the electronics and test equipment industry. And uh, Brian is focused on both taser energy weapons, but also the Axon body-worn cameras. And so part of his responsibilities, or one of his main responsibilities, are to design and conduct investigative tests and processes, including research and scenario-based tests. He also acts as an expert witness for federal, state, local, and foreign courts. And I'm going to bring him in here right now. And there he is. Hey, how you doing, Brian? Oh, I'm good. Excellent. Hey, thanks so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we've we've met before, uh, not a uh, long time, but uh, um, I know for sure that uh, you've got a ton of information here. And I can already see there's some people from New York and Serbia uh, here. That's great. Um, I want to start off by asking you about your background. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you were the, the kid that drove your kids crazy, breaking stuff open and trying to figure out what was inside, or uh, or did you get into this uh, area in, in a different fashion? Uh, yeah, I was, I was always that kid getting in trouble for taking the watch apart or trying to figure out how things work. Um, so I always wanted to get into engineering. My goal in college was to be a design engineer but then I discovered test engineering and just fell in love with with testing stuff. I'd rather break stuff than build stuff. So, yeah, no, no kidding. And what was your journey like from uh, you know when you were thinking about what you were doing? I mean, you obviously got into you know electrics, electronics, and, and that sort of thing. But can you give me a little bit of like the journey uh, into before you got into Axon? Like, what was that journey like for you? Yeah, so I started in a calibration lab doing calibration and repair of test equipment, and um, from there moved to high power engineering. I worked at a company in California uh, doing uh, UPSs, uninterruptible power supplies, and then um, moved to Arizona. And I saw the position open at what was then Taser International. I was, OK, that's very interesting. So started in research and development, quickly moved into test engineering, and I ran the validation test department for uh, approximately 10 years. OK. and. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, Taser, were you in Arizona at the time always, or, or was it a different location? Uh, it was always here in Arizona. Okay, okay. Okay, good. So then, uh, you know, moved into the test engineering, then, um, you know, slowly moved into the forensics of it. And, you know, um, doing so much testing on the product, you get to know the product really well. You become an expert in everything about it. So they asked me, you know, would you want to you know, serve as a expert witness in a case. I wasn't really sure. I'm uh, sure I'll try it. And so I did it and I loved it. So um, pretty much moved into now full time. I'm just investigations and forensics. Right. Yeah. Some pretty cool stuff. Um, so there's, I have to say this, like, there's a lot of stuff that I want to cover and I run the risk of like jumping around or whatever. And uh, I have a, a terrible habit of misspeaking. So I'm going to count on you to kind of keep me straight here if we can. Uh, I'm going to do my best here. Um, so let's, I want to talk about uh, Taser a little bit because, um, well, it's sort of an interesting beginning. So the CEO is Rick Smith. And um, as I understand it, he, well, he had the idea early on. I'm going to say it was like in the 90s or something like that. It, it, it was around that time. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that's correct. Um, it was basically he had um, some close friends who were murdered um, in a road rage incident. Mm -hmm. And that got him thinking, you know, technology is advancing constantly really fast, but the bullet hasn't changed much. And yeah. um, people are killing each other with guns. There's got to be a better way to stop someone without killing. And so that's that pretty much started the, the journey with Taser International and then Axon. Right. Yeah. And actually, uh, in preparation for this interview, I actually, and I didn't realize, but R Rick had written a book and um, I'll, I'll just bring it up here for a second, but it's called The End of Killing. And if anyone's interested, you can go in and, and have a look. But I thought I especially the section that was relevant to our, our talk on, on, you know, sort of the beginnings of Taser. It was kind of interesting. And, and I think there were two things that struck me about the book. The first one is the story that you just told me, which was his two uh, I believe they were high school uh, friends that he had uh, that get into some kind of a road rage into incident and they they get shot. And the second thing was, um, well, I, f I, f I found he was quite sincere in the book. I believe him to be quite sincere, but there in a lot of the videos that he does, and even that he's online, he really talks about ending the, you know, sort of displacing the gun as we know it today. And is, is that is that a theme that sort of is is spread through the company, like through Axon? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's one of our pillars. One of our the mission of the company is to obsolete the bullet to stop killing. So, um, you know, we want the taser weapon to be so effective that they can go to that, you know, first choice as a, right. you know, as a force option. You know, so it's there's a, a lot to do, um, but we have got great engineers and um, we're on our way. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a there was something that I heard Rick talk about, which is like this use of force continuum and like trying to explain, and, and it makes sense, right? Like if, if you have, if you have a device that is effective, but it doesn't kill people. Right. And I think that's the, that's a sort of an interesting concept. And he talks about the use of force continuum and that, you know, the more effective the tool, then the more deadly or the more hurt that it does. And so, um, the taser seems like a logical idea and also the fact that it doesn't have uh, a lot of long lasting effects after. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. That's exactly it. So um, you can, if you can make the taser, the one that stops the person, which is your goal, stop the person. If it, the taser can do that without causing harm, then, you know, that's a better world. Yeah. So, can you give me a brief, uh, and I realize there's a lot of stuff on, on the history of the, the, the taser, but, um, and, and even the terminology. So when we talk about, uh, and maybe, maybe you can help me with this, uh, CEWs, taser energy weapons, like, can we just clear us up on the terminology? So we're using the right words here. Uh, there is a lot of terms there, CED and ECD, and, you know, there's a lot of terms for it, but, you know, in the end, it's a taser weapon. Uh, we are currently called a taser energy weapon. Um, people have called it CEW, um, ECD, CED. Um, there's different names in different countries, but in the end, I just call them taser, taser energy weapons, taser weapons. Okay. Can you, can you kind of walk us through how the... I'll just call it the taser has evolved from, let's say, the very first sort of design. And I believe the uh, in in the uh, in the book, uh, Rick mentions uh, uh, a colleague of his and his name. I think his name was Jack. Is it Jack Hoover? Uh, Hoover. Jack Hoover. OK. And he talks about actually Jack had this idea. He's like a, a an engineer or a physicist from NASA, worked on the, you know, on the the I guess the one of the Apollo missions in the 1960s. And then he has this idea for this this. Uh, taser and, and i believe he's the one who first called it after a, a some kind of a childhood hero or something that he had um but um the what what was the first one like what was the first one that uh, jack Hoover made was that uh, yeah what, what was the design like well the design i mean it had the high voltage it had the you know the electricity to um you know put in you but it was mostly um sensory nerve stimulation so it hurt but it didn't have the the muscle stimulation uh, behind it so the evolution uh even when rick smith got involved and it became taser international um well the first one the first tasers were actually firearms they were they were uh, deployed with gunpowder 
Um, so the, one of the first goals was to make it a non-firearm. So we went to the um, uh, compressed gas to deploy the probes. So there, it's no longer a firearm. But then it was to make it more effective for someone who's truly motivated or on drugs that numb their senses and they can't feel pain, they would be able to fight right through it. So the technology advanced to um, hit the motor nerves and affect them without relying on pain. Okay. So, you, you said two things there that, that um, sort of uh, prompted me to think about something. So the first one you said was it's discharged through gunpowder. So it was considered a firearm, a type of firearm. And so actually, didn't it get banned at the, at the beginning? Or wasn't it somehow the whole idea was quashed because it was using gunpowder? Well, for civilians, it was because you had states where it wouldn't be allowed. Um, so yeah, in the early days, it was just law enforcement. Okay. And then you also talked about the way that the, uh, you know, sort of your the energy, like the fact that it hurt. And I believe in one of the papers that uh, we'll get to eventually, but you talk about um, the, um, you talk about the fact that pain is kind of like irrelevant because, you know, people's threshold to pain changes, like depending on the situation they're in or, or if they're intoxicated. Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. Um, intoxicate, intoxication, drugs, uh, or even without that, just everyone's pain tolerance is different. Um, so, what I feel is going to be different than what you feel. And someone, you know, who's tough, they fight a lot. Um, you know, they, they're numb to it. They, they can fight through a lot more than I can. Um, and so, and then when you add drugs to that, some people, you know, they might be on a drug where they can't even feel pain. So it would be ineffective if you're not hitting those motor nerves. Right. So the, how has the, the taser, uh, technology evolved, let's say from like 2000 and on to today. Can you, can you kind of give a brief summary of the evolution of the kinds of things you're, you're aiming at putting in there and, and what kinds of, uh, for example, even just things like the, the size and the, the way that you're manufacturing probes and things like that, what kinds of things can you say, uh, with respect to the direction that these things are evolving in? Well, one is size, um, you know, officers, that, you know, they want to be able to carry it on their belt and it's not too heavy and too big. They don't have a lot of real estate on their belt. So we try to make it smaller and smaller. Thank goodness over, you know, from 2000 on technology has gotten smaller and smaller and we can pack more in there. The first really effective taser weapon was the M26. Uh, that one, um, you know, really had the, the uh, power to stimulate the muscles and hit the motor nerves. Um, but it was a big weapon and had eight AA batteries and, um, you know, it was, it was a large weapon. So as technology advanced and microprocessors got smaller and all electronics got smaller, we could pack it into a smaller package. So the uh, Taser X26, uh, that was a lot smaller, just as powerful. And then, you know, we've moved on, uh, you know, the X26P, the X2, which have a lot more smarts in them. It's recording a lot more information, a lot more memory inside. And so okay. now we're at the Taser 7 um, and, you know, packed a lot more technology, um, you know, adaptive cross connect and the logging ability of logging every single pulse. Uh, it's, you know, it's just increased without making the weapon bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. So there's, there's voltage, there's current, and there's resistance, those three things. How do you, how do you typically explain the operation of a taser? Like if you go into trial and you got to explain it to a juror or somebody that's, you know, not, not technical, how do you typically describe the way this is, this is working? So, um, the first thing is that the most important factor with a uh, energy weapon is the charge. The charge is the amount of electric current that is flowing over a period of time. That is uh, an important safety factor and effectiveness factor. The voltage is really what drives that. The voltage is what allows current to flow. And so really uh, the main point of having high voltage on a taser is being able to jump an air gap and go through clothing or if the probe didn't puncture the skin. Other than that, you wouldn't really need the high voltage. And so the high voltage just allows the electricity to flow uh, even if you don't have a physical connection with it. 
So uh, explaining that to a jury, you know, you got to at first explain charge because the main thing we talk about in the pulse graphs is microcoulombs. Everyone's like, what's a microcoulomb? So you have to start with engineering 101 class for the jury and then go from there and explain here's where it's all relevant. Okay. So has the, has the, the voltage requirement for tasers changed in the past decade or so? Is, is, has there been changes to how much voltage you need out of these weapons? Uh, the open circuit output voltage hasn't really changed. Um, it's approximately 50,000 volts. Um, and so, you know, but that's also kind of irrelevant because once the point is to get it to the human body and affect the muscles. Once it's hitting there, the, the voltage is not 50,000 volts, probably closer to between one and 2,000 volts. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And, and then in terms of the... In terms of the amount of, let's say, current, okay, or the, the, the charge that's being affected by a person, um, how does that compare to, for example, something like a, a regular, like, you know, the machines that people get for therapy and they get hooked up to, like, I, I forgot what they're called, but, uh, you know, muscle stimulating machines or whatever they're called. How does, how does the current relate or the charge relate to, like, those machines percentage-wise or, or what can you give us? Well, the, they're similar uh, to uh, taser technology and that they provide a pulse. So the electricity is not like what you plug into your wall outlet, you know, 60 hertz AC. It's not like that at all. Um, a taser or a TENS unit actually pulses a very short pulse of energy. And so uh, how the current compares is the most relevant would be aggregate current, which is the charge multiplied by the pulse rate. Um, so how fast is it pulsing and how much current or how much charge is delivered in each pulse? Okay. So for example, like DC current is, is constant, right? It would kind of just hold it. And so is there, um, is there, a, is there a danger or is, for example, this, this pulse, is that more effective? Cause you, you do it, uh, well, I guess different, um, different models will pulse differently, but the latest one I think is the taser seven. Is that one at, is it 19 or 22, uh, pulses a second? That's 22 pulses per second. Okay. Okay. And different models we've changed, um, you know, we've optimized the duration of the pulse because that does matter. There's medical studies where um, the, the size of the pulse, um, not just the charge, but the duration of the pulse can, uh, the muscles react in a different uh, efficiency. Okay. I see. Um, so in talking about the, uh, the effect on the human body. Um, how how safe would you say these the, these taser energy weapons are um, overall in their general use? Like, I don't know if you guys have a measure of, you know, how many times they've been deployed versus how many times, you know, people have been hurt. Like, for example, I know that um, Rick Smith, the CEO, has talked about, yeah, there are there are there is some risk uh, there for sure. But uh, overall, I mean, obviously, um, I would think that if an officer is using taser, and I'll make this very clear, that you're obviously using a weapon or a device that is not lethal. So it's not a gun, because if you fire a gun, uh, you know, you, you're, it, ha it has serves one purpose. So obviously the, uh, the taser is a good idea. But I'm just wondering in terms of number of deployments versus, you know, sort of bad outcomes, uh, is there a measure or, or something like that that you have? Uh, I don't have the, those stats. Uh, I know we're, um, you know, we keep a stat on live saved, you know, which is, you know, the number of deployments where it could have turned deadly and it's, you know, it's over 300,000 now. So, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing the technology and the, um, the impact that it makes. Okay. The, uh, Oftentimes I've heard this rule of like, uh, so for example, when you fire the, uh, the, the probes, um, like this spread, it's, it's like a 30 centimeter spread. It seems like somebody says like, is that like a minimum spread that where you get enough current going through where it's enough to sort of, you know, stop somebody? Um, or is it better to go even wider? Um, uh, even wider and also where it is on the body. So the placement of the probes is important as well. So how the weapon works is, um, if you don't have a lot of muscle mass between those probes, then you only get a localized effect or maybe even just pain. 
Um, but the more muscle mass that's between those probes, the more muscles that are receiving that pulse, that signal, then the more muscles that are affected. And what happens on a single pulse, the muscle contracts and relaxes. But when you do that 19 times per second, or even 22 times per second, it gives the appearance of just a solid rigidity. So that, and I think that was going to be my question before was the fact if you're with DC, for example, like you're just, it's going one way. But um, I think what you're saying is that the fact that you're pulsing, this this pulsing effect is what locks everything up. Is, is that the idea? Um, yeah. So looking at the different types of electricity, you have DC, which is always on. And then you have AC, which is alternating, going up and down, up and down constantly. The pulse, it's um, a very short, very quick pulse. And that's just to stimulate the, mo the motor nerves. Um, so you don't need a lot of that energy behind it, like for lighting a light bulb or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. It's just sending that signal to the muscle. So it's a very low amount of energy. Okay. Well, I, I'm probably going to ask you some more technical questions, but I'm, I'm curious about the the public's perception about tasers. So um, do you, I mean, do people feel that, you know, well, it's a taser now, so, you know, police are gonna be using it more because, you know, they know they're not gonna be, you know, killing people, whatever. Like, is, is that a common perception or misperception? Um, well, over the years, it's gotten better. Um, I think the early perception was that it's electricity and electricity kills you. And so, you know, that, that was a really poor perception. They didn't understand the technology. Most people don't understand the technology, but I think they've, um, you know, uh, come to an understanding that, okay, tasers are safer. And, you know, but still people don't really understand it. Um, I think my, the number one misperception that I see is even though the trigger is pulled on a taser, doesn't mean that there was a connection to the person. And so, you know, say you have an incident where there's 10 trigger pulls, they say the guy was tased 10 times. Well, if you didn't have a connection, maybe you had a connection on the first one, but then he's roll, you know, he rolls around and breaks a wire and then they pull, you know, they're trying to arrest him. They keep pulling the trigger. He's not affected by the other nine times, but the, you know, the press still says, oh, he was tased 10 times. Right. Okay. So, yeah. So the connection, the way, the way it connects obviously matters. So if there's, you know. Uh, like I, there's actually a, a video that I saw online where there's a uh, like a police sergeant or whatever, and he's he gets tased as a volunteer, uh, you know, to to get this. But one of the probes actually goes through the thicker part of his jeans, I think. Like there's a, where the pocket is or whatever, so it doesn't actually penetrate his skin, and he's still able to sort of you know move forward towards the uh, the, the the person that's tasing him. So uh, uh, that that seems like an important point. Um, so I think you've done some work in this area though to look at. How can you tell, um, you know, when you when you fire the taser, what kinds of things can you look or investigate to say that, yeah, it actually did make a connection and actually did, you know, cause, uh, you know, the, the, the intended effect? Yeah, so that's something we started, you know, once we were able to put more memory into the weapon, we started logging um, what we call them pulse logs or pulse graphs. But basically the weapon will record the charge and the voltage on every single pulse that it generates. Now the voltage, it's not necessarily the output voltage, it's a voltage inside the weapon. Um, however, that tells a story that tells um, how basically the charge is uh, what the weapon's putting out. The voltage would tell me how hard is the weapon working and that can tell you what type of connection you have. Um, whether it's a poor connection, a good solid connection into flesh, or no connection, or even arcing. Okay, and um, I know that there's some people, like I believe it's Rick Wyant, who's been doing some, who did some early work with uh, like the tasers looking at probes and trying to see is, are there visual ways of inspecting it? And then there's, uh, uh, there, there are other people, for example, that are using, you know, scanning electron microscopes and things like that, looking again. Yeah, yeah okay. that'd be Darko Bavik. Okay, so what kinds? So can you explain like what some of these methods and techniques are to actually look at and try to show objectively that uh, current has passed through the probe? So yeah, with probe analysis, the the probes are attached to a wire, but the wire is not like welded to the metal. It's just a, a knot tied in there on the old probes. Uh, the newer probes, it's crimped on there, um, but there's a, a gap there, so. 
when the probe is connected to the body and conducting the electricity, the electricity has to pass from the wire to the metal and the probe. That leaves a signature um, that can be looked at. So um, for instance, the scanning electron microscope, you can look really closely at the metal and see the signature of how many pulses actually went to, uh, went to the probe. Or you can also, um, one that I do is looking at the wire end and looking at the uh, insulation of the wire and the uh, end of the copper end of the wire to see is there evidence of discharge. I see, okay. Um, can I ask you about, there, there are three papers and one of them I have up and uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize before, but it looks like they were all uh, done or presented at around the same uh, same time at this uh, I IEEE conference or uh, on November fourth, twenty twenty one. So not too long ago, and right. uh, you know a, a few different uh, things that you're looking at here. And so I was wondering if we could just briefly go through them. So this first one here is detection of arcing and high impedance with electrical weapons. So I think this this one relates to what you're talking about on the device itself. Like you can you can determine whether or not you've made proper contact on the device? Correct, by using the, um, the data inside the weapon, the pulse data, analyzing the charge and the voltage, we can determine what type of resistance we were going into. And if you know that type of you know, resistance or impedance, then you can determine, okay, this must have been going through skin and fat, or it, this looks like a lower impedance, like going through uh, muscle tissue, or maybe this is a really low impedance, like arcing in open air. So air is not conductive. However, once you apply a high enough voltage, the air molecules ionize and become conductive. Ah, okay. That's how, that's how electric arc works. And interestingly, in here in this uh, in this first study, you also talk about the the sound pressure and the and the way it changes with resistive load. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah. So when a taser weapon is fired, if it's arcing, that actually makes a louder, um, uh, snappier sound. Um, but when it's conducting into a load, whether it's a resistor or flesh, it it dampens it, and so it becomes a quieter. Um, you know, more dampened, um, you know, like a ticking sound rather. So analyzing the audio, uh, say you have body worn video or, you know, uh, you know, cell phone video or whatnot, you can tell if there's arcing, uh, arcing connection, or if it's arcing just in front of the weapon, or if you're actually conducting to the person. I see. So it, it all helps put all the forensic puzzle together. Okay, so this other paper that you did here, estimation of physiological impedance from neuromuscular pulse data. Uh, what can you tell me about this one and how does it differ? Um, it's similar, but it's different because we were looking at, so everybody's body is different. Um, there was a study done in, I believe, 2009, um, where we measured the resistance of um, a taser exposure. So we had probes inserted and we measured a range of 400 to 800 ohms. And that was just off of you know, a sample of people. So that's, that's a pretty wide range. The overall average was 600 ohms. And so depending on physiology, depending on the person's hydration and you know, chemical levels, everything, their resistance is different. So you can't have the weapon you know, just try to put out an output at a specific resistance it has to be able to handle this wide range of physiological resistance. So in this, we use the pulse data to try to predict what type of resistance we were going into and had fairly, fairly accurate results. Okay. Um, and again, like these are all things that are helping with validation and helping from an, an investigative standpoint, right? Because I mean, you have to testify, so you need something to lean on like this kind of research. Yeah, and sometimes the situation they really need to know was there a good connection um bad connection uh you know what what's the story and so sometimes by the perception the incident happens so fast and um you know there's a big mess so once the dust settles you can look at these and determine okay here's why the you know why the person had this reaction or whatnot so okay the uh the, the final one that i wanted to talk about was the output of electric electronic muscle stimulators, physical therapy, and police models compared. So this is the one where you took these, uh, 
I, I guess they're like, are they just retail kind of machines you can buy that you just hook up for relaxing your muscles or, or that sort of thing? Is, is that what you were doing? Yeah, so Dr. Kroll led this this study and um, it, it took uh, different um, TENS units that you can buy on Amazon and measure the output of them, um, you know, using an ANSI standard uh, and compared the output of them to the output of the taser weapons. And um, when you consider the aggregate current, it wasn't a whole lot different. Um, and these are, you know, devices that are therapeutic, you know, and uh, athletes use them to, you know, get bigger and stronger. <laughs> and, you know, so um, I remember being hooked to one at a chiropractor once and, you know, you know, really different feeling. But yeah, so comparing those, those people, the perception is these are safe because they're approved by the FDA. So comparing a taser weapon to them, you know, I think it, it was a very interesting paper to look at the output and, you know, it, it's very similar to these FDA, FDA approved devices. Yeah, there was a there was a comment in there somewhere where it, it said that the strength of the contraction induced is less than 50% of the voluntary maximal contraction, since the primary effect is merely to cause a subject to lose voluntary control of the affected muscles. So, uh, so what does that mean? Does that mean that the uh, it says less than 50% of the volume, so meaning that strength wise, I mean, somebody could actually contract their muscles another 50% greater than what the the, the taser is doing? Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, especially with the tens units you can dial in um a certain strength um based on what you're trying to accomplish if you're just trying to uh, just you know work your muscles a little bit versus get really you know hard workout i mean i, I don't use them so I, I i don't i don't know the exact example but i know you can dial it in and so um you know our study considered that okay um i want to ask you about uh, cases, because I mean, you obviously testify, and I'm curious about some of the questions that are asked of you. Um, are you? I mean, you've done this several. I mean, you've gone several times to testify. So, are, do you see a repeating pattern in, in certain places, like things that come up regularly? And what what can you talk about? What those might be? I think the biggest one is was there a connection or not. Um, another one is what time was it. Um, I, that's probably one of the number one things I testify on what is clock drift. Um, so j clock drift, it isn't thought about much anymore because devices are connected. Your cell phone, you don't have to adjust the time. The time's automatically synchronized to a network mm -hmm. server. Well, um, the current taser devices, they are not connected. And so their clock is free running. So if you have an agency who hasn't synchronized their clock in a long time, you can get a difference in the time that something actually happened versus what recorded in the log. And that can be deceiving. It's been used, um, it's been used as uh, you know, a controversy in cases before that, okay, say for instance, there was one, it was a taser deployment that didn't connect that turned into uh, officer involved shooting. Um, however, the log of the taser showed that the taser was deployed after he called shots fired on his radio. radio. So then it's a conspiracy that, oh, he must have right. you know, fired the taser after. So, but looking at the logs, looking at time sync records, we were able to show that, okay, it's just the clock was off by four minutes or whatnot. So. Okay, I see. And in terms of the like the connection like how well something uh, had connected so um uh, like for example there's a case that i worked on that involved a taser or whatever as well and, and there was a question about the uh how well it connected or maybe didn't connect but the um the current model of taser is the taser 7 that's the latest and greatest correct correct okay so it, would you say that one has the most intelligence and the, and the greatest amount of recording right now um, yeah, it has a lot larger memory and um, recording a lot more information. Um, same same pulse data, except on the Taser 7, instead of just, uh, you know, plus or minus two paths, we have four different paths that it can take. So we have four sets of charge and voltages that we're recording. So yeah, a lot more data to analyze. So it's and well and a lot more effective, right? So effective. If I understand it correctly, you be, uh, in the Taser Seven, you're actually loading uh, two probes, uh, two sets of uh, cartridges, I guess you'd call them, right. and um, the 
they they cross talk basically so if the top one if one let's say you, you fire one the top one hits and the bottom one misses then you fire again and the next two connect um you you take advantage of the the two sets of cartridges together is that true that's that's correct you could theoretically miss with one cartridge hit the top but miss the bottom and then the second cartridge hit the bottom and miss the top and still have a connection oh interesting and that's only in the seven so the previous models didn't have any of that uh the x26p only has one cartridge so uh it does not the x2 has a chance of uh cross connect um but it's not something that we force to happen it's just um, what's happening in front of the weapon where the electricity wants to go, it takes the path of least resistance. So if cross connect is the path of least resistance, it'll take that, but we don't, we weren't able to make it happen. With I Taser see. 7, we make that happen. Okay, interesting. Um, I, there's, there's a few questions here. I just want to see if we might be able to take a, a couple here. Um, and then, because otherwise I will forget. Um, so one of them is from Low uh, Lay. Uh, are the civilian tasers as effective as what law enforcement uses? So are there any differences between the two? Um, as far as electricity, no. It's the, it's the same output. It's the same, um, you know, it's the same waveform uh, that's built into the law enforcement units. I see. Okay. And, and there's also, um, uh, Axon is now making, there's other devices that are like taser like, so there's one that looks like a flashlight. There's one, like a personal use one that I saw. It's, it's, a uh, it kind of a better, nice design on the outside, making it look aesthetically pleasing, but there, there's other forms of this that, um, Axon sells, correct? Yeah. Um, so for instance, the flashlight, it's called the strike light. Um, that's more of, it, it, it's not, it doesn't have a cartridge. You can't shoot probes from it. So it's more of a, a stun or scare device. It's got a very loud arc. Um, and so, you know, but you can't shoot a cartridge from it. We do have civilian products that you can shoot a cartridge from. And um, if you get that connection, cause the neuromuscular incapacitation. I see. Okay. Uh, there's a question here from uh, Kara. So she said, do your studies ever include unbranded models? <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure you probably get involved with some other models, but uh, I'm um, not sure what you can say there. Yeah. I've been asked by law enforcement who say they found an unbranded model or, you know, uh, something from overseas um, to assist in identifying it or, you know, measure the output. It doesn't come up often, but yeah, that has come up. Okay. Uh, there's a question from John Paolucci. It's a little long. I'm, I'm just going to ask it though. But he, he basically says that if I understand correctly, now you can download uh, the data from the pulse data from the taser. And how, how, so I think the answer is yes, but how do you actually do that? Uh, so the taser, we have a USB pack. Um, well, it depends on the model. So let's go to the older smart weapons after the X26. Um, we have the um, a USB pack that plugs into where the battery goes, and um, that plugs into your USB on the computer. Running our proprietary software, you can download the data or even upload it to evidence.com and look at the graphs. Um, with the Taser 7, the um, logs and everything load onto the battery pack, and then the battery pack gets loaded into a dock like these behind me, um, and that uploads to our server. And then ah, the, okay. the graphs are actually created by the server, you know, by the software on the server, and then you can view them online. So do you often get asked to interpret these things? Is that part of your role? Yeah, um, that, that's, that's something I do quite a bit is interpreting the pulse graphs. I see. And um, I mean, is it typically when it's a more serious case or something like that, or uh, do you get requests fairly regularly from you know, law, law enforcement agencies is, hey, we got a, we got something here that happened. Can you check this out or? I say clock drift and pulse graphs are the most common things that I work on. Um, so it, it comes up a lot, not necessarily in, you know, uh, larger cases. It might be one where agencies not, you know, uh, they might get sued later or it might be an issue later. So let's just go ahead and do a report now and take care of it. I see. Now you also do the, like the body worn cameras. So you do the, like the body cams as well. So, Correct. um, I don't, I don't want to go there because then I'm, I'll, that's a whole separate one. So at some point in the future, I may get you to talk about that or, or something like that, but sure. do, um, are you guys looking at coupling them together or do they already kind of talk to each other or is there any communication between the taser and another device? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so for the older generations, we came out with a battery pack that had a Bluetooth uh, module in there and um, was able to uh, send a signal to the body-worn camera. So if the tasers, armed, they could configure it, but say tasers armed and deployed, their body-worn camera would automatically start recording. So you're not relying on the officer to remember to you know, tap the button and start recording. Taser 7 has that Bluetooth built into it. So you don't need a special battery pack. It, it's already there. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, I wanted to bring up a video here of one of the, uh, uh, just I had a high speed video uh, for the Taser 7, but I wanted to ask you about what is actually uh, deploying these things. So in the, I think the first one was, you said it was gunpowder and then it went to compressed air. Um, I believe uh, here, let me see if I can do this here and let me add that. Okay, so there, there it is there, and I'm just gonna let this play, but um, how, how do you actually, what, what is actually launching these probes? What's, what's the energy behind there? So on the Taser 7, that is compressed air that is actually launching them, but how does that happen? There's actually a small initiator in there. When given that, when given the deploy signal, that initiator ignites, which causes the, the air pressure in there, and the gas capsule is um, punctured and the air is released and pushes the probes out. Let's so see. Taser 7 is a little bit different. The wires are actually in the probe, which allows, uh, which allows the probe to come out in a straighter fashion. Um, the, the older X2, X26P, the wires were, um, they're packed in there in kind of a accordion shape. So as the probe comes out, it um it's pulling the wire with it which causes you know a little bit of instability this was a huge improvement to cause more stability to the flight of the probe okay so to be clear in like here these are the probes here at the front and where we see the wire coming out the back uh in this little cylinder are they uh is it is it just how, how are they just wound are they spooled yeah. yeah it's just a spooled spooled wire okay well, that's pretty interesting. And that helps with stability. Um, what can you tell me about, uh, like I'm looking at the, the separation between the two. So uh, there are different angles uh, that that you can choose, like, let, and let's just maybe keep it simple on the Taser 7. But what do you offer in terms of the, the different types of cartridges? So we have uh, two types of cartridge for Taser 7. One's the close quarters and one's a standoff. And that's our generic names for them. Uh, the close quarters has a wider spread. So if you're close to someone, uh, well, let's go back. With older models, if you're very close to a subject and deploy, you're not going to get a lot of spread. Um, but with the close quarters cartridge, a wider angle that the probes are coming out at, or actually the top probe comes out straight, bottom probe comes out at the downward angle. So if you're close and have a wider angle, then you're going to have a wider spread when the probes hit. Um, the standoff is a smaller angle so that if you're further distance, you're not going to miss them with a really high, you know, high amount of spread. Uh, they're closer together, but you have to be a little bit further distance. So it's, you know, two scenarios that can happen in the field. You're either close or a distance. So we try to cover both of those. What's, what's the farthest, what's the farthest shot that you know of that's been, that's made contact? Uh, in the you know? field? don't know but i have done a um 25 foot shot but you know it's uh, that's a huge spread especially with x26 that's a huge spread at 25 feet um, right right and this is what you're this is what you were talking about here uh now this is the older uh, x26 actually can you maybe describe what we're seeing here and I'll, I'll pause it here but there's a whole there's a whole bunch of little uh these little i will we'll call them i'll call them confetti and you can give the, the proper term for them so proper term is aphid tags, anti-felon ID tags. Um, so every cartridge that we sell is recorded who purchased it. Um, for a civilian market, um, the um, person purchasing needs to go through a background check. If, um, if they have felonies, we won't sell it. So um, those tags have the serial number of the cartridge printed on them. So um say if there's a taser used in a robbery or something like that that confetti would be on the ground so the forensics can pick them up look up the cartridge serial number call us and then we can provide who purchased that cartridge i see okay um when it comes to 
training. Um, what, does Axon have like different training programs? Do you have people? I hit my I hit my mic. There. <laughs> Let me ask again. When it comes to training, uh, does uh, Axon have different training programs and different levels of programs? What kind of things do you offer as a company? Well, so um, Axon does, um, you know, as far as law enforcement training. Um, each agency is responsible for their own training of their officers. However, we do train their trainers. So uh, they're called master instructors. And then, you know, we have different levels up to senior master instructor. Um, so we train the trainers on how to train your users, um, you know, the law enforcement users on how the device functions and all that. We also offer um, special classes like our evidence collection and analysis uh, as an ECA class. And then recently, I just I just started teaching a pulse graph class. So I'm teaching uh, investigators how to analyze the pulse graphs and what they actually, you know, how to interpret what's going on with them. Interesting. And you have, uh, I also noticed that you have a virtual reality training too. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know a ton about the VR, um, you know, segment. Um, it, it's uh, one of the, the um, our growth with Axon. We now have a department that does VR, but um, I know they're doing a lot of the empathy training and, um, you know, scenario training using VR rather than, you know, uh, firing tasers. We actually make sensors like Taser 7 has VR cartridges that you plug in and you can do, uh, an officer can do VR training with his Taser 7 that's assigned to him. Oh, that's awesome. And the uh, I noticed that Axon released a, uh, it's kind of a tracking bracelet very recently for the, uh, I guess it's the HTC Vive system. So I, I just saw it the other day and I'm like, it says Axon on it. I'm like, what the heck's that? I go, <laughs> so uh, I realized there's a, uh, and, and I'm not sure if that was developed, something I'll have to look into and maybe you know or you don't know, but I'm not sure if it was developed as for, as part of your group, as part of the training. Uh, this, well, yeah, it's, it's for, it's for the law enforcement training for the whole VR training package. Um, uh, who developed that? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure on that detail. And so, uh, so if people want to, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm interested in it, but in the VR, but if, if people want to go in and, and, uh, practice, like, do they just, uh, you, do you have like a taser for them or do they bring their own taser and how is it, how is that tracked? Well, that would be up to the agency on, you know, whether they're using their own assigned tasers or if they have a batch of them. Um, so it's all in the details of how the program's built. But in the end, you know, you can do scenario training in a room with, you know, um, conductive, you know, cardboard dummies and shooting that. But doing VR and actually being placed in a scenario, um, the memory that you take from that and the um, you know, even the muscle memory of the movements and all that, it sticks with you a lot more when you're doing the, it with the VR experience. You know, so I noticed that, that um, you, you sell, uh, I, I've seen it before. It's sort of just like a, a pad with the figure of a, of a man on it, like a silhouette of a man. And then people can, I guess, practice target shooting on that. Are there other accessories or things that you sell as well? Like to help people train? Well, um, well, for training, it's mostly the, the targets and the VR, um, but most accessories are, you know, different holsters, um, you know, different accessories like that. Okay. Okay. All right. I gotcha. Gotcha. Um, with respect to research, um, one of the things that I found is that there doesn't appear to be like a massive amount of data out there right now in, in the sort of the scientific field or in the forensic field. And I was just wondering, are there, are there any any thoughts that you have on areas which have, or sort of like low hanging fruit or, or opportunities that people, where work needs to be done? Like where, where should people be looking at or what would be useful in terms of research? Because I mean, there's some people here that maybe, uh, you know, academics and different universities or they're already working in the forensics field. So um, if you had to sort of recommend areas of research, uh, what, what would you suggest? Um, well, I think what's lacking is mostly in the data analysis. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to, you know, we had three papers put out at the conference last year. Um, at, but still, I think there's still more work to be done on types of connections, um, you know, different scenarios that can cause a type of connection. And, you know, even the 
you know, even the clock drift. Um, I don't know of a paper out there on clock drift. Um, and so that's and on my plate. Uh, <laughs> right one. Um, yeah, I don't know of any studies out there. And that comes up in almost every case that I work on. Um, so it's amazing. The medical research has been done. I mean, it, it's, there's so many medical studies on taser technology, uh, the waveforms and everything, the, the muscle response. But the data forensics and the physical evidence, uh, that's, that's where I think, yeah, we need to do more, um, you know, more studies on the actual, you know, shots and arcing connections mm -hmm. and, you know, what that all tells us. I see. And so, uh, let's see here. Yeah. I got a couple, just a couple more questions. What about, what can you tell us about, uh, obviously I realize, I realize there are company secrets, but what can you tell us about the future or at least the direction of where the taser is kind of going? Like what, what can you say about, you know, maybe not, maybe specific details, but is there anything you can say about the kinds of things that you're trying to achieve, uh, with the taser and the next generation taser? Unfortunately, I can't share a lot. Um, <laughs> I, I can say it's really, really cool. Um, so, and brings us closer to our goal of obsolete in the bullet. We're constantly working on effectiveness and safety, and um, that's our number one goal. And so, yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I can't give any details. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Fair enough. And uh, I mean, and, and to that end, the um, I believe. Uh, maybe I heard it from you, but you had talked about obsoleting the bullets. There's actually a target. You have a company target for that. Yes, yes, that's that's one of our pillars. One of our primary goals um, is to obsolete the bullet. That's right. Uh, and but you have a certain year in mind too. Well, it's within the decade. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I know it's a moonshot goal, but I mean, we're we're dedicated to it. Um, right. Really good engineers, really smart people, and it's it's a passion here. It's just everybody everybody is on board. Nobody here I know of just has a job. I mean, everyone is charging. So no, that's, well, that's good to hear. Um, there's one question here. So this is from Lola again. Is there any way to avoid the clock drift? Synchronize your clock. So <laughs> it's every time the weapon is uploaded. So with Taser Seven, the clock's actually held in the battery pack. So every time you dock it, the clock is synchronized to a network server. On the older models, when you download it on the USB pack, the clock is synchronized. So um, we recommend agencies synchronize their clock once a quarter. Um, you know, and you'll still have some clock drift there, but it's manageable. Um, but the more often you synchronize the clock, the less you have clock drift issues. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, there is a super cool video that was just uh, out. I think it. I think it was just released yesterday, and yeah. I'm going to see if I can share this. But uh, for anyone that's interested, um, I just did a search on YouTube for Axon, and this this one came up. But it says Epic FPV Drone, and uh, I'll just let this play without sound or whatever. But it's super cool. Uh, and so, w were you uh, were you there that day when they when they were when they were doing this? I was in the building, but I'm not in the video. So, um, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> It is very cool video they put together. Very impressed with the drone pilot, um, but pretty much, you know, trying to show people how cool it is. You know, even I, I come to work every day. I see this building every day, and I forget how cool it is. And so, just being able to give uh, them a really cool tour um, was awesome. So yeah, this was just put out yesterday. All right. Well, yeah, if anyone wants to check it out, go ahead. I'm not, not going to let it all play because it goes on for a little while. Actually, when I think it's going to be over, it's like, holy mackerel, like this, they just keep going and going. So, yeah, uh, kudos to the pilot there for sure. So, yeah. um, well, look, Brian, uh, I think we're going to we'll leave it there. But I do have uh, the last thing that I wanted to share is uh, if anyone has uh, questions for you or if anyone, you know, maybe has a, a case that they need help with, um, is it OK to share your, uh, your your details, your contact details with them? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And uh, yeah, you have your email address here. So let me just bring that up. Uh, it's right over here, B. Childs. And you're also on, I, I think you're, you're on, uh, you're on LinkedIn as well. So somebody wants to. Yes. Okay. Okay. So people can reach out to you there and probably even through the company as well. So right. uh, excellent. Well, look, Brian, uh, I don't want to take up more of your time, but I really appreciate it. Appreciate all your knowledge. You're doing some really cool stuff. Uh, I have to say Axon sounds like a, a really, uh, a really uh, forward thinking company and uh, you know, kudos to the CEO, kudos to you as well. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I I'm serious about getting you back for the, the body worn camera stuff. I, I do want to talk about that because I know there's a bunch of stuff there as well. Yeah, absolutely. We'll plan that out. Excellent. Thanks so well, much. Thanks for having me. All right. Cheers. Hey, hang back and I'm going to, uh, uh, I'll, I'll catch up with you in a second here. All right. All right. Cool. 
All right, everyone. Well, that does it for this particular episode. Uh, there's a lot of information there. And geez, I feel like I was jumping around uh, a little bit, but so many questions that I, I wanted to ask. Uh, certainly learned a lot in doing some of the research here. So, well, look, I want to say thanks to everyone. Really appreciate your time. Uh, this is up on YouTube now. So if, uh, if you're not watching this live, hopefully you'll be able to watch it a little bit later on. So cheers, everybody. Have a great day and we will be back next week. Bye-bye.